Hey everyone, welcome to MedKids Provider Spotlight. We have been interviewing the most awesome private practices all over the United States and in Canada now. Um, so right. we, yeah, very cool. So we have been really enjoying these interviews. You have been enjoying watching them. And so today we have a really, really fun guest. Um, we have Dr. Christopher Wilson, and he is a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified sex therapist and supervisor, and an AAMFT approved supervisor. He has worked in the mental health and social services field for over 20 years. Very decorated, Chris, very decorated and welcome. Excited to have you. Thank you. Yeah. So I know we kind of want to dive into it and I'm really curious and I'm sure everyone here is really curious about, you know, your story. I feel like every time we have someone here, it's, you know, always very unique. And so what inspired you to, you know, open up your own practice? Yeah, I, I started in the field like the, like tw over 20 years ago. I started out in as a college student being a resident advisor. And then after graduating with a degree in public health and a degree in theater arts, I decided to go into mental health and worked in residential with children for a number of years and then kind of floated around in social service for a couple of years before going back to grad school. And went back to grad school and studied marriage family therapy because I saw so many issues were like systemically related and, you know, both in terms of family issues, but also in terms of like the larger sociocultural elements that we come from, messages that we get from social culture. And as I continued to work in community mental health, it was amazing, but also pretty tiring and draining at times. And um, I saw more and more of a need for there to be more LGBTQ representation. Um, and so I started my practice in 2017. That is amazing. So let's, let's dive in, you know, I, I see your passion. And so can you talk more about, you know, the population that you're serving and, you know, why have you been so passionate about it and what has been unique about, you know, your practice and, you know, seeing people come through the door and, you know, and, and helping them. And what do you feel like that, that need is? Yeah, I, Really, unfortunately, there is a limited number of LGBTQ therapists out there. I mean, we're lucky in Philadelphia because there's a number of practices that are doing that work. But even still, it's myself. It's Emerge Wellness. And that's and first. And that's it. Like, we are kind of the, the people on a couch of polar ones. But we're like a minority in the field. And we need more LGBTQ representation, more LGBTQ therapists to be working with our population. Um don't get me wrong, there are amazing cisgender and heterosexual therapists out there doing great work, but it's something different to be working with somebody who's part of your community. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I work a lot, particularly with gay, bi men, men who are questioning things, and that can be men who are cisgender or non-cisgendered, um, and they're trying to figure out their identity. They're trying to figure out sexual orientation issues. They're trying to figure out sexual dysfunction issues. That's a lot of the work I do personally, um, but I do work with a grouping of other people too. I have clients that are lesbian clients. I have clients that are non-cisgendered. I have clients who are um, polyamorous and kinky. So I work with a lot of kind of the bigger umbrella of the LGBTQ community, the kink community, the non-monogamous community uh, myself. And I started having a team come together in 2022 because I really wanted to have more clinicians who did that work. And I knew a lot of the ones that we're already in Philly, um, but I wanted to broaden that a little bit more and really have it be a home specific for LGBTQ client in particular. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting. And I think it's really cool that you have developed something that, you know, someone can go onto your website or they're seeking a certain kind of therapist and counselor and they, they you, you fill that niche. Like you fill... You know, they can go there and say, oh, okay, like you work with people like me and like automatically exactly. like comfortable. And, you know, I'm sure like a lot of people don't share those same resources. So it's really cool that like it is so upfront and like, yes, you can come to us. You're accepted here and we want to help you. And like we, we have people that are working with other people like you to to do that, to help you move on in your journey. So I think that's really great that you have made that so like abundantly clear and helpful um, to all the people that you work in the population. So that is really cool. So how is your kind of like speaking about your approach? How is it different? And what kind of therapy do you offer? What kind of like modalities? 
Yeah. So I personally pull from a couple different lenses of therapy. The one I mostly pull from are ecosystem and structural family therapy, which basically just argues that the families we come from influence who we are, not as, only as an individual, but in relationships as well. And it also looks at the larger sociocultural systems we come from, like what are our communities of support, who do we get along with in our lives, those kind of things. Um, and look to see how that influenced us as a person. I work predominantly with adults at this point in my life, but I, and in my career, but I have a long history of working with children. I work with children from, um, doing math right, 2005, I think to about 2015-ish, <laughs> um, uh, over, over a de decade really. Um, and I love working with children, but as I got more into the field and more into my niches, it became very clear for me, like I really wanted to work more with adults, particularly around sexuality-based concerns. Um, so because of that, I also pull from social psychology, which really just kind of argues like our larger sociocultural system influences us heavily, right? And that includes things like feminist theory and looking at like social um, changes, uh, the stages of change model, trans aka the trans theoretical model, um, and how those things influence us as people and as we change and as we work towards behavioral change. One of the things I really love about the trans theoretical model in particular is that it kind of just highlights like we are going through stages of change and we're going to have times where we falter and that's okay. It doesn't mean you've lost everything that you worked on. Um, I sometimes work with clients who are dealing with active substance abuse history or in recovery processes. And, you know, they'll have a time where they, you know, go back to using and they feel horrible about it. And one of my things that I try to do as a therapist is that they, you made a mistake and you can still work on improving your life. And just because you had one slip does not mean you all is lost oh, and that you yeah. do a whole bunch of hard work already to get dead. Um, and so we want to acknowledge that. Um, so I really do pull from a collective lens of uh, family system theory, other um, psychological theory, as well as because of a background in public health, health belief model, things of that nature, because I mean, those things are important too. Yeah. Like kind of like I said earlier, very decorated. You have a lot of <laughs> toolbox that you've been able to use. And that's, that's really cool. And I think, you know, it's really helpful for your clients. Like when you have so many different backgrounds and so many different ways you can pull. And, you know, I feel like everyone is not cookie cutter, obviously, and different things work with different people. And so I think that's really cool that you can use different modalities or different way of working with people to have them advance and have them move forward. And um, kind of to that nature, sometimes, you know, as humans, we kind of get in our own way, or maybe we get scared about doing something. Um, what would you say to someone that is like, maybe a little bit nervous about moving forward and, you know, seeking help, getting counseling? Um, what yeah, I mean, therapy is really about it being a place for them to kind of explore who they are and what things they want to change in their life. It's not our job as therapists to be like, you must change X, Y, Z. We might encourage them to think about things they might want to change. Um, we might think they are areas that they should change, but you know, that's not our job. We don't get to call the shots on that. When I work with clients to develop like what we're going to focus on treatment, what we often have call our treatment plan, but some people call them like roadmaps or there's a whole bunch of other language for it. It's really taking like what they're telling me is what they want to work on. And then I can offer my clinical insight to say, okay, well, you're talking to me about this. I wonder if this muscle might be related. What do you think about working on that? So that's where the collaborative process comes in. Um, myself and I know all the people part of my team, we all think about things as systemically oriented. We all think about things as a collaborative process um, because we recognize like we are not dictators as therapists. That's not our job. Our job is to be there, to be supportive and to be caring. So. I think the biggest thing I would say people who are trying to figure out, like, even if they want to go into therapy, it's just like, recognize it's just a place to explore. It's not a, I must do A, B, C, and D to get equity results. Yes, sometimes we do work on very specific behavioral-based interventions. But there are a lot of times it's just a self-exploratory process, thinking about the relationships they have in their lives, thinking about the goals they have in their lives, thinking about feeling stuck and what it means to feel stuck. Um, and I also like to, I'm, I'm very you know, very honest with my clients. I have my own history of depression. I know what that's like from a lived experience standpoint. I have my own grief history and I own that in my therapy process. You know, we oftentimes call it as uh, 
myself as a therapist in kind of clinical language, but it just basically means we're sharing a little bit of our own lives. We're not going to overshare. We're not going to give you like personal details that are just not appropriate, but we want to make sure that we are giving little nuggets that clients can go, oh, this person can relate. This person knows a little bit about me. And that's also kind of coming back to the LGBTQ population. Like that's part of the reason I wanted to do this work and part of the reason I wanted to uh, build a team because the reality is they don't have to educate us. You know, if you go to a cl clinician who is cisgender and heterosexual, they might be very well-meaning people and do wonderful work. But when you have to start educating them on definitions and cultural dynamics of the LGBTQ community, you're now educating them. And I think we all as therapists are going to take something for our clients because not everyone's the same, right? Everyone's going to have different lived experiences. But there are oftentimes themes that we can see in people's experiences. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about being part of the community and working with the community. Um, and also because I work a lot with men or male socialized people, I also think that's something that I share as well. Like I've been socialized male, I identify more gender queer at this point in my life, but the reality is I've been socialized that way. I understand what those dynamics are like personally. Yeah. And you know, no one has ever explained in that way, Chris, is that like you are exploring, you know, sometimes people like got to get down to the meat of it and it got to get better, you know, like it's all these things that sometimes people might associate with going to therapy or going to see a counselor. But I really like that you put it in this process where like we are exploring here and like we are going to help you explore and like in a safe space in a safe way. And so I, I really like um, that definition of what you think, you know, you know, therapy and counseling is and, and kind of, you know, to my next question is, you know, luckily we're living in a world where, you know, the stigma of getting, you know, help and, you know, seeking out mental health services is, is getting better. There, I feel like there still is, people are still always cautious, but, you know, for how can we break the barrier about like talking about mental health and how do we make that easier and how do we encourage um, others who maybe aren't, you know, quite there yet, um, how do we be supportive of them? How do we be supportive of people? Yeah, that are ready I think to part of it is just part of it is just being empathetic, listening yeah. to people and what's going on in their lives, being caring. I think those are two of the biggest things that really come from therapy because we're going into this not because we're expecting to make a ton of money at therapists because we don't, um, but we're looking at it as like I want to care, I want to give back, I want to be empathetic to people. Um, I would say like if you're struggling to figure out like oh is therapy right for you, recognize that like. It's about a therapeutic relationship. And the thing we know about research shows over and over again, it, it's the therapeutic relationship that I'm going to have. So if you work with somebody, you meet with them a couple of times, it doesn't feel like a good click, find a different provider. That's an amazing thing to do, a self-empowerment moment. Also recognize that you might not be in long-term therapy. Some people really do come in for just a handful of sessions, get what they need, and they move on. That is awesome. Other people do work for months or if not years with the same therapist, and there's no right or wrong to any of that. It's such a personalized journey. I, I myself, I'm, I'm like that is very transparent with my clients. I have my own history of therapy and I have worked with some therapists for a couple of months. I have my current therapeutic relationship for a couple of years because I just really like the way we work together. Um, and that's helpful. Yeah. And I think it's really cool. Like some people, you know, maybe it's their first time going to seek someone out and they're not really sure how this roadmap goes, right? And, you know, I love what you said is like, if something is not clicking and like working, like notice that and like go to a different provider. And I think it's really important to like, you seem to be, you know, really individualized. You really focus in on that individual and really caring for them and being, you know, the empathetic person in their life. Um, but, you know, some people don't know what that's like. And so I think that's really cool that you, you know, I can tell how much you really care and you really want to dive in and help them explore. So I think that's a, a good note to people that maybe are watching that are realizing mm, maybe I should have made a change or it's okay to make a change, you know, or I don't, I'm good and I don't have to go, you know, every so often everyone's journey looks different. And I think that's really great that you explain that because I think everyone is different. So. Yeah. I really empower personally, really empower clients to really think through like what their frequency need. Most of the time I want clients to start off either weekly or the we to start out so I know what's going on in their lives and I can help them kind of craft the goals that they want to work on. But once we get rolling, I'm very much a person of like, find the fit that feels good to you. If that's every two weeks, great. If that's every three or four weeks, also great. Um, 
my general role personally, and not everyone has this role as part of my team, but my role is I'm open to once people get to a place where they feel like they've hit most of their goals and sometimes they want to do maintenance work, what I call like check-ins or maintenance work, I'm happy to still see with them every four to eight weeks. You know, my only restriction is that I want to see you at least six times in a year so that we have some consistency and there's a level of continu um, continuation of care. Uh, but as long as that's going, I'm happy. And a lot of times when that starts to happen, clients go, hmm, maybe I don't need to come in as very often as much as I did. Or maybe I'm actually in a good place to start moving towards winding down. And that's what we want at therapist. We want clients to feel like they can be on their own and either check back in with us at a later point or they got what they needed and they move on. I've had some clients who have like called me like after finishing and were like, hey, Chris, I would love to come in for like one or two little like check-in sessions just to like run this other issue that came up to you. And it sometimes happens like a year later, you know, they'll, they'll finish the therapy and they'll be like, Hey, can I run this by you? I'm happy to have you come back in for a session or two and we'll just do a quick session or two. And then you move on your way again. And that's awesome too. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love that path of just like checking in too and like how you really invite that and still care for the person, even though you might not be seeing them all the time, but to have that say like, Hey, you still have a resource here. And like, I really want to help you. And I think, you know, lot, not a lot of people get that. So this has been super awesome, Chris. I really appreciate everything that you've been able to tell us today, your journey, um, and how much you're helping other people in your community. Can you tell everyone that's watching and listening um, where they can find you and reach out? I'm sure there's a lot of folks that um, might have questions. Um, so yeah, tell us where to find Easy you. Way the easiest way to find me is um, you can find me at centerforhealthierrelationships.com. There's also a uh, Instagram page, which is chriswilsonphd.com because that's before I actually spread things out, but, you know, brought people on, but, uh, you know, kept it the same. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the easiest way to contact me or they can reach me by email at cwilson at centerforhealthierrelationships.com. Call me on my cell, which is a work cell, just to clarify, work cell uh, at 4844. Four six nine eight seven zero five. Um, I'm happy to meet with people in different ways. And if they don't think I'm the right provider, but they would like my insight, I'm always happy to get people connected to other providers. I did that earlier today. Someone said, hey, like the rates just don't work for me. Awesome. Here's some other great clinicians to look at. Um, I know a lot of the other LGBTQ providers and male providers in the Philadelphia and PA area um, and in other states because I'm licensed in other states as well. Um, and so I try to get people to the right fit. If that's not me, I want you to get to where you need to be. That is so awesome. I, I, you know, it's great that even if you know you're maybe you're not the right fit for that person, that you're still trying to help them and trying to get them on their way to get help. And knowing that like that sole mission of helping people is more important than anything else. So that's a beautiful statement. I love it, Chris. You are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, we enjoyed having you today. Folks, reach out to Chris if you have any other questions um, or would like to chat with him. And we would love to have you on again sometime soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Thanks Chris.